I did them a while back, and I'm kind of in the mood to start doing them again here on this Schleg Daddy TV channel. That's sports Q&As. Now, my plan is to do them at least through the month of July, every Wednesday and every Sunday. If the demand is there, if I get enough questions, I'll definitely entertain the thought of doing more of them. But for the time being, every Wednesday, every Sunday, for you sports fans out there, you want to have your sports questions, regardless of the sport, answered by me, the Schleg Daddy, here on a Q&A episode on the Schleg Daddy TV channel. All you have to do is go to Twitter, tweet your questions to me, at PFSpot underscore Schlegel. And I'll put all the information on how to partake in these Q&As and participate by asking your questions. I'll put that all in the description box down below. So I got a few questions here I decided to go ahead and get through now. Um, at Chris Cody 8 asked the first two questions. The first one is, who is your pick to win the World Series this year? Well, based off of the move that they made yesterday, acquiring both Jason Hamill and Jeff Samarja from my Chicago Cubs, the Oakland Athletics definitely appear to be in the driver's seat right now. I love the construction of this team. I love the uh, way they are assembled, and I love the move of getting both Samarja and Hamill. The Oakland A's are in it to win it right now, which is exactly what the hell they should be doing. And then Chris Cody 8's other question is pertaining to the trade with the acquisition of Addison Russell, the Athletics 2012 first-round pick, who is also a shortstop. Where does that leave Starling Castro? Here's the interesting thing. we got to keep in mind that just because Addison Russell was obtained, that doesn't mean he was obtained for the Cubs long-term. I fully envision the Cubs being in the David Price trade market in the offseason, and I think in large part this deal that was done with the Athletics to get both Addison Russell and Billy McKinley was done in mind with the thought process of being, we can take these two prospects and flip them for David Price as part of a package in the offseason. I'd be stunned if the Cubs didn't make a serious play for David Price in the offseason. I'd be even more stunned, frankly, if David Price didn't end up in a Chicago Cubs uniform in 2015 because Theo Epstein has to recognize that with all the nice young bats that he has accumulated in the system and those some of those young power bats, especially with the names of Chris Bryant and Javier uh, Baez and Kyle Schwarber and one that goes under the radar a little bit, Arismendi Alcantara and then Jorge Soler and so on and so forth. You know, the one thing that they're really lacking is impact power pitching, especially top end of the rotation power starting pitching. And he knows that he's going to have to do something at some point in time. You can't keep acquiring prospects forever. You're not a Pittsburgh Pirates organization. You're the Chicago Cubs. You're in a major media market. Castro could be one of those guys that is held on to, and he plays shortstop long term. He could sit there and be... You know, move to center field. He could be moved to second base. He could be traded himself. A lot of flexibility and a lot of different possibilities. The good thing about Castro and the position that he plays and the contract that the Cubs were able to sign him to is that he is a very tradable piece if and when it gets to that point in time. So who knows what's going to happen with Castro. Like I said, though, when it comes to the acquisitions of Russell and McKinley yesterday, I do feel that they were acquired in part as kind of luxury items so that way they could be flipped to the Rays in the offseason to acquire David Price. At J.H. Mills 22, what will it take for the Detroit Pistons to be title contenders? Um, I love their front court of Andre Drummond and Greg Monroe. They have to get rid of Josh Smith. That was a dumb, dick, bad free agent signing, and he's a bit of a locker room cancer. He's a cancer on the floor for them as well. they got to get rid of Josh Smith. That's the first thing. It's going to be addition by subtraction, I promise you. Number two, I like the thought process of bringing Stan Van Gundy in. I thought that was a good thing to do. Uh, the other major thing they need to do, they need to find a big-time playmaker at guard, whether that's a point guard or a two guard, preferably at the point. They need an all-star caliber guard and some patience because they're not going to contend right away in the Eastern Conference. It might even be three or four years before they can even consider it. Maybe find a way to accumulate a couple of other nice young pieces. Maybe use a draft pick or two on a foreign player that you won't bring over for two to three years. And then when you maybe can find that big impact star quality guard to go with Drummond and go with Monroe and maybe a few of these other pieces, maybe an international player here or there. And as the Eastern Conference starts to get older, um, you know, the Pistons could be in the picture at that point. 
And Chris S. Krager asks, who would you consider the second most overhyped NFL team behind the Cowboys? In general, um, it's the Cowboys by a mile. There's no question about that. Um, second most overhyped team. Now, that's an interesting one. I'm not sure if I have a specific answer for you other than maybe the New Orleans Saints. Ever since Hurricane Katrina, the coverage of the New Orleans Saints, the narrative about the New Orleans Saints organization has shifted dramatically in NFL circles and in national sports media circles. So maybe you could argue, even though they definitely had some success, unlike the Dallas Cowboys, you could definitely look and see how the Saints are protected and how they are projected and how they are presented compared to other teams. And maybe I would throw them into that category. At John Cena is a tool. Who, in your opinion, is the best QB in the NFL besides Peyton? Brady, Breeze, and Rodgers. It's funny how everybody pretty much acknowledges that those are the top four you know, quarterbacks in the league, that these are the elite of the elite. Um, I'm not sure if a number five really stands out. I think you can make an argument for Andrew Luck. I think you could definitely make an argument for Cam Newton. I think you could definitely make an argument for a Russell Wilson. I think you can make an argument for some of the other pocket passer quarterbacks, maybe like a Matt Ryan. I'm not sure if there's a clearly defined fifth best quarterback. If you had to ask me who I would take, it might be Andrew Luck, but I'm not 100% certain on that. And your other question from at John Cena is a tool. Most underrated and overrated quarterback in the NFL. Most underrated quarterback in the NFL. I think to a certain degree is uh, Cam Newton. Because I look at all the coverage that a Colin Kaepernick gets with a much better all-around team around him compared to what a Cam Newton gets when I feel Cam Newton is clearly the superior player. And when people talk about the young dual-threat quarterbacks in the 2012 class with Luck and RG3, you know, I look at Cam Newton, I'm like, why doesn't he get the same love? Why doesn't he get the same attention? And I think he's underrated. I think people sleep on just how good Cam Newton is as a dual-threat quarterback, not just as a running quarterback, but as an actual quarterback, as a pocket passer. Now, sometimes he struggles a bit with his accuracy, but let's be perfectly realistic here. It's not like Cam Newton's ever had a plethora of weapons to work with in the Panthers' passing game. So it's hard to fully judge him. He's gotten a lot out of very little. In terms of overrated quarterback, Romo, because he's a great stat filler and it means not a damn thing because time after time he folds in the big moments and the big situations. Another really overrated quarterback might very well be Eli Manning because of the two Super Bowl titles. He is an average quarterback a lot of seasons uh, when he's not taking his team to the Super Bowl. Um, you know, is he a guy that may someday get into the Hall of Fame, even though he might not fully deserve it? Perhaps. Uh, other overrated quarterback, in my opinion, obviously, Jay Cutler. I still don't get how people all of a sudden at 31 years of age think Jay Cutler is going to have this renaissance resurgence season in 2014. The same argument that they gave in 2013 when he played 11 games and he was still mediocre. I don't get it. At Chase Oliver 68 asks, who will be your surprise team to make the playoffs for the 2014 NFL season? Um, if I was looking at the AFC, I would say the San Diego Chargers in part because I don't think a lot of people are talking about them, Chase, even though they made the playoffs last year. They won a playoff game, and they played the Broncos very tough on the road in the AFC Division round. Frankly, nobody's really talking about them, and I think there's definitely a possibility that they could make it back to the playoffs and surprise people this year. Um, another surprise team might be the Baltimore Ravens, just from the standpoint of they didn't make the playoffs last year, and I envision them making it this year, so that would, I guess, be a bit of a surprise. Um, in terms of the NFC, well, AFC, maybe some people will go with the Houston Texans, and I'm not sure if you ride or die with Ryan Fitzpatrick for 16 games, you're going to be good enough to get to the playoffs, but their defense might be good enough to keep them in it along with their running game, so that could be possible. NFC-wise, St. Louis Rams, Atlanta Falcons, and Detroit Lions. Um, at Jacob Castle 42, what is your favorite all-time NBA moment ever? Or what is your all-time favorite moment in NBA history? Mine personally, obviously it's going to be Jordan-related. And this is hard because there were so many great moments that he produced over the years. Um, you know, I could always look back at Game 2 of the 91 Finals when he did the dipsy-doo lay-up-a-roo. 
um, going through the middle of the Lakers' uh, Swiss cheese defense. I could look at game one of the 92 finals when he did the uh, shoulder shrug after hitting the sixth three-pointer in the first half against the Blazers. Um, but at the end of the day, my favorite moment has to go back to the 98 finals in game six. It was a series of events. First, it was the after Stockton hits that big three, the Bulls are down three. Here comes Jordan. He scores quickly on a layup in about four and a half seconds, providing Chicago with a two-for-one situation. Understanding the game, understanding time, understanding good game and clock management and situational basketball. Michael Jordan, perhaps the smartest basketball player in the history of the league. Then you come back down in the defensive end of the ball, and here's Michael Jordan understanding that Hornacek is going to clear but when Stockton feeds into Malone, there's no reason for him to clear with Hornacek because Malone's not going to be able to see him. So he sits there, and he waits, and he pounces once the ball gets to Malone. He steals the ball. It brings it up court. And then, you know, the nice little crossover push-off on Brian Russell hitting the jump shot and just kind of holding it there. I'm like, you know, that's Michael Jordan. If I could sit there and say what encapsulates Michael Jordan's entire career, even at 35 years of age, what to me could I point to that says he is the greatest player of all time? It is that finishing stretch in his last NBA Finals game where he understood to get a shot up very quickly, not to go for a three, just get the easy two, now go back on the defensive end of the ball and understand the moment, the situation, and where he's at, and then to be able to have no fear, understand that he has to take that last shot, be able to set it up where an effective double team really wasn't going to be able to come, making sure that the shooters had time to space out the floor appropriately. And then, like I said, just holding it there. He just hailed it. It's my favorite moment in NBA history. And Mr. Big Pants closes out this Q&A. What is the earliest you can see the Cubs winning a World Series? Um, They got to get some pitching, and it's going to take some time. And it's going to take time for those power bats to come up to the big leagues. I would envision in 2015, at some point in time, you are going to see Arsmendi Alcantara, Chris Bryant, Javier Bas Vas uh, Javier Vasquez, Javier Baez, excuse me, all up at the big league level. Uh, you know, Alcantara might make it on opening day. I would have a guess that the Cubs would catch Super Two flu and they would make sure that they don't bring up those three guys until at least June first. You're going to have to get those guys some time. You're going to have to have other guys come up through the system. At some point in time, the Cubs are going to have to go out in free agency and plug in some of the holes in their organization. Um, you know, when I look at this team, I would envision 2016 at the very earliest is when they could potentially envision it. And this is, again, contingent upon them trading for a David Price, going out there and signing another big-name pitcher in free agency. You know, having some of these young talents come up, Chris Bryant and Javier Baez play at an all-star level. It's going to take time. I like some of the direction that the Cubs are going in. I'm still not 100% fully sold. The only thing that will sell me eventually is a World Series championship in Chicago. The earliest I think you could realistically expect that the Cubs could be in any type of real playoff or especially World Series contention would be 2016 for sure. So again, thanks to you that submitted your questions for the sports q and I'm going to try and do them every Wednesday and Saturday, or Wednesday and Sunday, excuse me, here on Schlag Daddy TV. Um, so go to Twitter, tweet your questions to pfspot underscore schlegel. Um, you don't have to use any fancy hashtag. You're sending me the question, I'll know it. Uh, so thanks again. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you again Wednesday for another Q&A. Make sure you check out all the great videos, especially the NBA videos going on right now here on Schlag Daddy TV.